Did you know that Joseph Smith was running for president when he was murdered in 1844? Spencer W. McBride puts together a fantastic book right here in Joseph Smith for President, which I read last week. It was one that came recommended from my friend Leland. Uh, I checked it out, and uh, even though it was short, I didn't think that it was one I was all that excited to get to. Not that the subject isn't exciting, I, it was just one of those historical books that I didn't necessarily find myself in the mood for, but it was short enough and I decided to take a run at it last week and ended up thoroughly enjoying it. Just within the first 20 minutes or so, I was like, man, I really want to see how this entire thing plays out. I have read a book on Joseph Smith's presidential candidacy before, but it was very short and it was a long time ago. All I remembered basically was that he decided to because his, uh, his people, the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, were dealing with a lot of legal troubles and persecution and uh, they'd been exiled from various states. The actual government of Missouri had issued an extermination order against them. It was a big, complicated mess and they weren't getting support for the rights that they were guaranteed under the Constitution, freedom of religion, and so on and so forth. And even after visiting the White House and checking in with uh, the sitting president, um, <laughs> the president was like, you know, I can't help you. If I do, then uh, the citizens of Missouri won't vote for me in the next election. And he's like, all right, you know what? Fine. Uh, in addition to everything else that I've got going on with the church and the city of Nauvoo and the Nauvoo Legion and all these other things that Joseph Smith was running, he said, uh, I'm going to throw my hat into the ring and run for president in the 1844 election as well. Um, he was my age when he did that. Joseph Smith was born in 1805. And so, yeah, 1844, he was 39 years old. And uh, he was a busy dude, didn't let the grass grow under his feet. Uh, McBride puts together a really great and I think objective snapshot, not only of this particular group of people, the, uh, the early members of that church, but also the, the temperature politically and socially in the country. He gives a, a pretty fair perspective of what freedom of religion should have looked like, but what it actually looked like and how the revolution basically was just a transfer of power from one particular set of demographics to another. It just ended up moving from uh, old European British elites to American colonial elites. And uh, they, <laughs> they put freedom of religion in principle into the Bill of Rights uh, as long as that religion was a particular general form of Protestantism. <laughs> they were they were not big friends. They were not big uh, advocates for other groups. Uh, Catholics were one. Quakers were another. The Society of Friends, I think, was their official name. Charles Carroll was one of the signatories to the Declaration of Independence, and he was Catholic. And even though he was English, uh, he was... <laughs> He was barred from being a, becoming a lawyer because of his religion. So it's not hard to understand why he would have signed on with the cause of the revolution and the Bill of Rights and all of that. And uh, even though on paper, these non-mainstream groups within Christendom or any other established faith, even though they had the rights of everybody else, in practice, it was very, very different. And this is something that Joseph Smith and the Latter-day Saints ran up against a lot. The legal protections for them just didn't exist. And when they tried to test and defend those rights in various legal theaters, the courts, and so on and so forth, they just found hurdle after hurdle. The system may have worked on paper, but any system is only as good as the people implementing it. And if they are self-interested or interested against you, then you've got to find another way. Uh, I found it also of interest that uh, this was, this all went down in an era of American history where federalism was more the name of the game in the sense that 
the states were left to manage their own business and a, a powerful top-down federal government, a central government, meddled far less often in the affairs of states. This is a perspective that not a lot of people have an appreciation for in the 21st century. And grasping that perspective would help people understand the Civil War, which popped up about 20 years after Joseph Smith was assassinated. Uh, people were far more... Uh, localized in not just in terms of their political interests, but their cultural interests. People would identify themselves as the state that they were from, not the country, not the United States, not as Americans. You're not an American man. You're a Kentucky man. You're a Virginia man. You're a New York man. And being all regionalized like that was one of the, the bigger influences in uh, in the Civil War and people siding with, quote unquote, their country, their country being Virginia or Georgia and those, quote unquote, countries making alliances with each other because uh, things were, were far more compartmentalized than we see them as now. Um, in describing this book as a fair look at this particular time period and this specific event, Joseph Smith's candidacy, uh, McBride is also pretty realistic about what Smith's chances were. He wasn't running on a major party platform. He was effectively running an outside campaign. And even though he had some early success and early popularity, that stuff, it, it was kind of similar to the way it goes now, where you can find a third party candidate who is popular with loud but small demographics that when it comes time for the rubber to hit the road in actual elections, it doesn't always pan out. Ross Perot, I think, was the last third-party candidate to make real noise in a national campaign, and uh, he was a big contributor to H.W. Bush failing in 1992. Ralph Nader kind of did the same thing in the year 2000. Uh, he didn't eat into Al Gore's margins as much, but uh, he contributed to a kind of evening of the numbers between Bush and Gore, which ultimately led to Florida and then one county in Florida being uh, the deciding factor in the national election. Since then, you've had th third party candidates with far less success. Look at you, Evan McMullen. And uh, now we've got RFK Jr., who I think is, is running a third party candidacy. But things are a lot more polarized and people are a lot more uh, entrenched in the two party system. I don't know if we'll ever see a third party candidate with the level of popularity that those of yesteryear have had. But in those days, in the early 19th century, um, whether he had a very dominant realistic chance, he had more than an outside chance, Joseph Smith did, of making some noise and being a, a power broker in nationwide electoral politics. As a final note of interest, his platform, I think, was was more popular than what actually happened in American history. He had uh, you know, positions on every major issue, and one in particular, well, two in particular, had to deal with slavery and westward expansion. Uh, he favored the abolition of slavery through, uh, I believe the term was manumission. Basically, you buy the slaves and then you set them free. And... On paper, that's supposed to satisfy the, the economic burden that uh, slaveholders would endure if they were suddenly to lose all the, uh, the production power that they controlled. That only would answer the economic question of slavery and not the moral one, but uh, in effect, it would make restitution for that loss, and then it would establish the... Uh, the freedom and the rights of these these now legally whole people. And as for westward expansion, uh, McBride described his policies as, you know, we want to, to expand to the other side of the continent and all that, but we want to bring in the Native American tribes with diplomacy and economy and, and basically their consent versus a militarized expansion with removal and land capture and all of that. Smith died on June 27th, 1844. He was killed by a mob and 
the ultimate winner of the election would be James K. Polk, which, if memory serves, he was only a one-term president, and he was an extremely consequential one. Uh, you can check out, who's the author? Hampton Sides' book, Blood and Thunder, which mostly follows the life and career of Kit Carson, but it does so against the backdrop of the westward expansion, and it culminates in the, the final defeat of the Navajo people at Carson's hand, kind of the, uh, the last major holdouts among the Amer American tribes uh, during the westward expansion era. James K. Polk was an extremely consequential president because he had the, the vision of manifest destiny. You know, all of this is North America belonging to the United States, and I will prove it. You know, he was, he was visionary, but there was a cost for that to, uh, to people that still echoes through history today. And if you were to look at those two different plans, doing it diplomatically versus doing it militarily, well, I think you can make a case for one of those being better than the other. But also, who's to say that a politician's plan would ever pan out exactly the way they did or the way that they wanted it to? Would Joseph Smith's plan have worked the way that he envisioned? Was James K. Polk's plan on paper more peaceful than it was in execution? That's worth looking into. All of that said, this was a fascinating and really, really good book. Uh, I put it on my best of year list when I was done. I thought, wow, I've read books about this particular era and this event before, Joseph Smith's candidacy, but this was easily the best one of them. And like I said, he was he was very fair, he was realistic, and didn't try to uh, present this as like, oh yeah, Joseph Smith was totally going to win and then he was killed and so on and so forth. If you would like to get a look at that time period in that event, this is probably, at least from what I've read so far, the best book on the subject. So check out Joseph Smith for President by Spencer W. McBride, and let me know what you think. Till next time, drive safe. See you out there.